Hello and a warm welcome to the Destructive Innovation Festival 2017. So this is the session, The End of Waste. And today we'll be discussing how do we reach the end of waste? Is it consumer behaviour that needs to change? Or do we actually need to move upstream and look at the retailers and the businesses involved? I'm Leela, and together with Lou, I'm really excited to host this discussion today. Uh, so, of course, though, we are getting to ask the questions, but this is supposed to involve you, the viewer. It's why we're running the session. So we'd really like questions and comments coming through as well. You'll find a comments box uh, just under where you're watching this video, and we'll try and incorporate those into the session. Uh, otherwise, thank you for joining us. So what's the context? Why are we having this discussion? In August this year, we started, or we consumed, uh, more from nature than our planet can re renew in the entire year. So we're effectively in ecological debt. By the year 2030, we're set to consume resources equivalent to two planets. Now, I don't know about you, but this uh, seems like the sy sy symptoms of a consumer-driven and wasteful society. And I'm really interested in trying to figure out how do we fix this? But how do we fix it? Because despite our best intentions as individuals and consumers, can we actually make any change uh, and try to uh, set a different trajectory for our planetary use? Or do we actually need to start looking at the root cause? Start talking about and focusing on fixing the system that actually surrounds the consumers and everything that they buy and are involved with. Today, we are thrilled to be talking to two people who have been catalytic in providing systemic, pushing systemic change forward. With us in the studio is Adam Hall. Adam is Head of Sustainability at Surf Dome, Europe's largest active sportswear retailer, where they have incredibly managed to take away three quarters of their plastic packaging, 74%, and now everything goes out in recyclable, recycled and bio biodegradable packages. Thanks for joining us, Adam. Online from New York, Brooklyn, is Alden Wicken. She's the head of a, the founder of Big Pardon, of a cult. She's a freelance uh, journalist and she writes about sustainable and ethical living. She also founded a creative group which now has 80 people, all ethical writers, promoting sustainable living and their style. So thanks for joining us, Eldon. We welcome you both to this discussion this afternoon and we're really looking forward to it. Back to you, Lena. Excellent. Thanks. So we're going to open the discussion today with Adam in the studio uh, here with us. So and we're wanting to start at the retailer end. Um, so you've said in the past that as a retailer, you're not going to solve the world's problems, but you certainly shouldn't be uh, contributing to any of the problems. So I was hoping, I guess, you can elaborate on the role of the retailer in the system, uh, addressing the issue of waste and unsustainable consumption. And I guess then also, if, if it's not just your role, who else should be involved? Absolutely. Um, well, for when, I, when I made that comment, I was referring to our own business. Um, <laughs> And, and as a singular business, you know, we, we, we're not in a position to solve this problem on our own. Um, I think retailers as, as a whole um, is a different question. Um, but certainly for us, we work in a, we operate in a, in a highly engaged market. Um, we, we, we provide to ocean lovers and, and, and extreme sports athletes that are generally um, often referred to as the, the, the canaries in the coal mine. So they're on the front line of, of where these issues actually lie. So actually, if we, uh, contribute to that those issues that they're seeing um, it would be the equivalent of us eating our own arm um, if we actually damage the sports or, 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 or the the activities that we represent it, it, it just doesn't make sense whatsoever um, but I think if you blow that open to the to the wider retail market um, retailers are in a unique position that they're, they're the conduit between um, the customers and, and the brands and the suppliers um, so actually they, they have a very unique position to actually alter the mindset of the consumers and actually say hey look this is what we should be doing 
or even cater to their needs. And actually at the same time, they can actually stipulate to, to the brands or, 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 or the companies that they use to actually say, look, we, we need to shape up um, because our customers actually need this. So I think there's, there's, there's influence they can have in, in both directions. So I, I, I think retailers have a fundamental part to play. Thank you. I owe Eldon a huge apology. Apparently, I just said that she was the head of a cult. It's an e-cult. I do beg your pardon, Eldon. I'm sorry. Um, you have been quoted as saying that you believe conscious consumerism is a lie. Could you elaborate on that for us and tell us how the individual who in all good faith may believe they're having an impact actually may not be? Eldon? Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. we can now. <laughs> um, so uh, if we focus in on the issue of waste in terms of conscious consumerism, and um, even we could talk about ocean waste. Um, for example, these crazy images came um, out of the coast off of Honduras last week, and um, it was basically a sea of plastic waste. And even in the article that I read where they were quoting the photographer who took these um, incredible pictures, everyone was saying, and she was saying as well, I hope people see this and they change their habits. Um, but the reason why this ocean in particular is filled with, um, is filled with waste is not because um, consumers like us who are highly educated, highly engaged surfers, um, beach lovers who travel to these areas, um, and really care deeply about these things. Um, you know, we're, you know, America, or North America actually doesn't produce a lot of plastic waste. Um, what's really happening is that people who live in poverty in Guatemala, who, where there is no recycling system or even waste removal infrastructure, are dumping their waste, their cheap disposable waste, into a river which is dumping it into the ocean. So when we see things like that, our, we see these pictures and we think, okay, I'm going to stop using plastic straws. I'm going to stop using plastic bags. I'm going to stop doing these things. When really, when we look at the problem, like what we're doing on an individual basis is, is literally a drop in the ocean. And what we really should be thinking about is why are the, the people who live in Guatemala or the people who live in Asia or Southeast Asia putting their plastic waste into the ocean? It's not because they're worse people than we are. It's not even because, particularly because of education. It's because they lack the resources and they lack the government-supported infrastructure to help them manage the waste that corporations are selling to them at, an, at, a, in a, at a way that uh, that fits into their budget. So uh, we have to think, okay, why, and address that why. Not and not immediately go back to humans are the worst or God we're so consumerist. It's it's more than that. It's it's meeting people where they are as humans and and supporting them um, in doing the right thing and making that right thing easier. Great. Thanks. Uh, just for the viewers at home, just letting you know, we're having a few uh, connection problems, but hopefully you're still getting Alden loud and clear. And so we are hearing you well, Alden. Um, Great. So, yeah, I guess it's interesting that you're talking about definitely the waste issue in the ocean. And so, yes, that's coming from a majority of Southeast Asian countries and we need better uh, recycling and collection infrastructure. But despite that, OK, so the Americans don't contribute a whole lot to maybe the ocean waste, but we're on a whole still an incredibly wasteful society. Uh, so I've actually been reading that. Uh, I guess in the textiles area, there's reports that 60% of all clothing ends up in incinerators or landfills every year and that Americans are throwing away the equivalent of 200 men's t-shirts per person per year, which I just find staggering. And so that might be getting collected, so we're not having it enter the oceans, but it's still not uh, the right way to be operating uh, with the materials and resources we have. So I guess maybe I'd actually like to talk to both of you about how we envision an entirely new model um, of existing and what this could look like as opposed to only collecting what we uh, create at the end. Um, and maybe Alden, you have some comments on this as well. So in, in every society, how do we address uh, the consumer problem? Yeah, so um, I think the main thing that we're thinking about and um, 
the main thing we're thinking about now is is creating um, a circular economy, and a circular economy means everything we create is sort of it's created the way nature creates things, right? They the tree grows, the leaves fall off, they're composted. They feed the tree, the tree grows, the leaves fall off, etc. Um, and so we're thinking about okay, how can we design things that can be endlessly looped through a cycle of, of our use? Um, right now, things are created in a straight line. Create the thing, use the thing, trash the thing, create a new thing, use that thing, trash that thing. And so we're putting all of our resources basically into landfills. Um, the thing is, is that right now there's no incentive to think about what happens to something after we're done using it, right? So um, if we're thinking about a um, if we're thinking about a soft drink company, once they sell us that Coca Cola bottle. They, they don't care what we do with that bottle, right? The municipalities, it's their job to recycle it, um, or it's consumers' jobs to take to, to be the good citizens and figure out where to recycle it. But um, they don't they, they have no responsibility for this thing that they created. So the next step to make to incentivizing this sort of circular economy is to make it so that once you create the thing, you have to figure out what's going to happen to it, and you have to take it back. And if we were to collect all of the Coca Cola bottles and dump them at Coca-Cola's door and say, nope, you're not allowed to put this in the landfill. You have to figure out what to do with it. Suddenly, they would be incentivized to say, oh, by the way, maybe we should redesign our bottles so that you know the labels are compostable. Um, maybe we should design them so that they're easily recyclable. Maybe we should invest in our own recycling centers to deal with this instead of offloading this on the taxpayers. So, um, so that's the two things, circularity and then supporting that through um, legislating uh, extended producer responsibility. Great. Can, sorry, can yeah. I just can I get your perspective on this, Adam? Do you need the support of your consumers, or can you see the system working effectively without them? Um, well, I, I think that to to, to Alden's point, um, I, I think that there's there's often that perception that it's 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 a problem elsewhere, yeah. um, and and I think that's that's. Sometimes, I mean, it, it, there's no denying it that there are issues in, in countries where there are no waste uh, refusal collections. Mm. But actually, it, it, sometimes there's, there's a disconnect, which, which I think can be quite dangerous for, for consumers um, that we deal with. You know, if they suddenly feel that's disconnected and that's, that's, oh, that's another country's problem, it's somewhere else, mm -hmm. you know, oh, someone else is going to sort that out. And I, I think actually, we we found in particular that actually that disconnect is very very real and and yeah. and we've we've actively tried to it wasn't necessarily demanded on us to actually make the changes mm. but actually we made those changes and and we had this 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 response from our customers that they didn't see the connection between the fact that they were passionate about ocean pollution and plastic pollution and the plastic that they were receiving they weren't seeing that connection that actually yeah. that could end up in the ocean and, and to a certain extent, you know, we are responsible for, for a degree of ocean plastic um, in, in, in the customer base that we deal with. So I think actually leading customers down that path is, is, is really powerful. And, and, and actually, we had a really positive response to that. And then people started connecting those dots. Um, I also think that actually we, we shouldn't underestimate the power that we actually have, um, particularly with our customer base and how we can actually disrupt mm -hmm. the, the system. Yeah. Um, and actually, we can disrupt it by by not buying these materials or, or better dealing with it. And actually, that will have a knock-on effect to the other regions that we're talking about. Um, it is a slow process, I understand that, and, and there needs to be systematic change. But actually, that's a good way to start. And actually, I, I think it, it's almost like um, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. You know, if we, we, we need to get our ship in order before we start talking about other countries and pointing the finger mm. um, and, and that's something that we did actually as as a company within our own industry and um, we, we we want to help the brands that we deal with to to better manage the, the packaging that they have and, and, and use better systems but we had to do it ourselves first and we had to prove yeah. it first that actually it does work um, and then we can go and talk to them um, so I, I think ask because it, it's sort of interesting with this fixing yourself first before looking overseas though that a lot of the problems caused overseas are by multinational companies. So mm -hmm. it is actually, you know, mm -hmm. fixing yourself actually helps fix uh, the whole system, uh, which feeds into all the other countries. It's all connected. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, obviously, they, they have different departments and regional departments, mm -hmm. but actually, um, 
I mean, Europe does t tend to lead on, on these kind mm -hmm. of issues. Um, uh, it, it, and, and I think it's it, it's often looked at as as, as an example of, of 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 how to follow. So, I'm I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a strong advocate of, of of trying to get those things going, getting it proven, yeah. and, and 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 working that way. And there does need to be systematic change in in, in lots of different countries. Um, it's a big beast to tackle, you know. We've yeah, <laughs> everybody's got to do their part, and 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 you know, awareness of the issue is great, but actually. We need to be tackling it on, on many different fronts. This is not a one solution um, mm. problem. Um, I've um, actually got quite a nice question coming through from the audience, which I think ties in well with what you're saying. So uh, Jeff is writing in saying, it's easy to think um, how we can dump Coca-Cola bottles on their door, but what about products that have a more ambigu ambiguous origin? So it's very hard for many of us to tell where our stuff comes from. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that's where you're saying that's the role of the the business uh, to actually try and change that. It's not the role of the customer to necessarily demand it of the business. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting actually because we've, we've been reading into this a lot and, and, and we've, we've looked at a lot of research on this and actually um, the, the, the modern consumer or even the youth culture of today, that they're now actually um, expecting sustainable products mm. um, and they're disappointed when they don't receive yeah. them. Um, they don't necessarily want to be fed that information about it. it, it we're very fast with the information that we take on and what we don't take on. Um, so they don't necessarily want to be fed that information. What they're doing, or I say they or, 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 or that broader group, it, they are um, they're buying per, per brand because the brand stands for something. Um, and the classic example is Patagonia. They, they've got the traceability um, mm -hmm. that they have. Um, it, it is very difficult and it's very difficult for for retailers, sometimes it's very difficult for the brands to even keep track of, mm -hmm. of their supply chain. It's, it, it's a rabbit hole of information and yeah, you, you're quite right. Um, it, it, it does need systematic change and, and I think there are some exemplary companies that are doing that. Um, we're working very hard with our brands to start to, to establish those yeah. different factors. But like I said, it's a rabbit hole. It's a, it is very complex. Uh, Lucy at Think Diff has actually come in and said, Adam, what would you do? How do you convince these brands that they should do something about the plastic waste that comes from them? And I know that you have 700 incoming brands into surf done, don't mm -hmm. you? Yep. Do you have a system in place? Are they aware of what you're trying to do? And are they working towards helping you and cooperating? Absolutely. Well, it, it's, we're very fortunate we work in an engaged market. Yeah. Um, the brands we're in the same market with the brands, so so we supply ocean-minded people. So they 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 want to do something. They yeah. they know they have to do something. The issue is for me is is actually um, is misinformation out there about what they should and shouldn't do. When you consider us and our business, we're talking about small to medium-sized businesses, not the yeah. large corporates. So they quite often don't have their own sustainability managers or or someone specifically working on that 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 task, that it's often the operation managers that are working on this. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. Yeah. Um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is fantastic at, at helping the big corporates, but the small to medium sized businesses don't necessarily have that support and that structure. And they're trying to weave their way through this misinformation, oxo, oxo additives, the plastics yeah. that we, we've been talking about. Um, they're great at marketing <laughs> and, and they're, they're fantastic at becoming the first solution that comes up whenever yeah. you look at this. If, as soon as an operations manager goes, I need to solve this, OXO additive comes up. Brilliant, I've solved it. So I, I, I think for us, we, we, are, we, are, we engage with our brands frequently. So, so we're having those conversations. We're making them aware of what we've done, um, which is creating a lot of interest. Um, and a lot of them are actually coming to us and going, this is fantastic, um, how do we can, can you help us um, actually get there? Because they're already engaged. Mm -hmm. uh, a later date, we will, we will start providing, well, we've had a set of guidelines that we will provide to, to our brands just to help them, the traffic yeah. light system, yes. do's and don'ts, um, and preferred. Um, that's later down the track, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, they're certainly engaged and they're, they're ready. Yeah, there's not resistance, you're getting there, that's brilliant. And I think that's, that's, that's across the board, you know, in yeah. business, you know, that there's such an awareness now that I, I think, Everybody knows they have to do something about this. There's no debate anywhere. Unfortunately, there is with climate change, if you compare it with, with, with another environmental issue. Nobody really debates plastic pollution. Nobody goes, well, actually, I don't mind it. You know, yeah. <laughs> everybody agrees it's awful. We need yeah. to do something about it. 
So and, and humans are good, you know, they don't necessarily they don't set out to say I no. I want to produce plastic pollution. Mm. So it's people are engaging with the subject. It, it for me it's it's the misinformation. It's it's and it's trying to guide um, businesses through that path of actually what is the best practice. Yeah, we were discussing earlier, sensationalism can lose all credibility around such a sensitive topic, can't it? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and I think that's, that's something that you know, we, we do need to be careful of, is, is, is actually providing the right information just so it's not discredited by yeah. sensationalism. In a controlled as you said. level that's been well analysed and researched, Yeah, you, you don't want people to get, get the excuse to go, well, that was debunked. Yeah. <laughs> it's all debunked, you exactly. know, so, yeah. Um, I might jump back in and bring Alden uh, back into the discussion with us as well because I really like what you're saying about, I mean, yeah, I also believe humans are fundamentally good. We're wanting yeah. to solve all of these issues that are coming up to us. And I know I'm certainly uh, fit in the conscious consumer um, bracket and I find it really hard letting go of the fact that I can't change everything. Um, so, yeah, I guess I was wondering whether, Alden, you have any thoughts on how... Sorry, um, how conscious consumerism could morph maybe into something more productive while still maybe giving the consumer or the individual some uh, sense of worth in the system? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so now when I'm talking to my readers about an issue, say uh, polyester microfibers, right? Polyester microfibers are these tiny little fibers that wash off of our polyester clothing and into the ocean and a recent study showed that um, they're in everyone's tap water all over the world we are all drinking microplastic you can't see it because it's my it's tiny 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 but it's there that's crazy it's such a crazy mm -hmm. fact that it's hard to wrap your head around it now old alden from two years ago would have said okay here's how you can stop putting microfibers into the ocean I'm still giving them information. I'm still saying, hey, there's this thing called Guppy Friend. You can wash your polyester in there. Or, you know, try not to buy polyester. But that, that's like at the bottom of the steps that I would tell my readers to take. If you care deeply around this, the first thing I say is figure out who the experts are that are working on this problem and give them your money, right? So there are several, there are several foundations, there are several nonprofits that are doing their research on this super fresh issue and establishing um, how big of a problem it is, you know, what what makes polyester wash off in manufacturing or with the consumer, all these different things. They need money, and they're the ones who are going to really make a huge difference. Um, you know, I was talking to Nicole Rycroft of Canopy, mm -hmm. uh, nonprofit Canopy last night at a panel, and she was, she was, um, they work on saving the rainforest through a variety. They used to work on paper, now they work on uh, fashion, because rayon viscose is a textile that is often made from endangered rainforest trees, um, which is crazy. And they have one commitment from Zara, H&M, VF Corp, uh, Gap, a variety of other companies to um, commit to going rainforest free. That was before consumers even knew that rainforest free fashion was possible or existed. They didn't know that this was a problem. So this wasn't something that was earned by a consumer boycott or letters or tweets. Um, it was earned by the nonprofit who is an expert on this issue working with companies in order to make that change. And they need as much money as they can get. So rule number one, take your money and maybe instead of overspending on um, eco-friendly products just for yourself and for your own home and your own diet and your own kids, and direct that money towards a nonprofit who will clean up the water for everyone's kids uh, in everyone's home, you know, and sort of spread that love around. Um, and the second thing I say is figure out what the legislation is, figure out what the political climate is, learn about what what is carbon pricing, how will that affect things, um, what are the solutions that are being floated, um, you know, it, like what could be a large scale solution? Oh, putting new filters uh, standard on all washing machines to catch polyester microfibers and figure out what those are and then tell companies and and your political leadership that, hey, by the way, I'm really concerned about polyester microfibers. When are you going to pass legislation to require filters on all washing machines? 
So that's a really, that's a really empowering way to get involved. And it takes a little bit more work on the front end, but it's a lot easier and less expensive than trying to think about all these different issues every time you make a purchasing decision, which is multiple times a day. You say, I'm donating money, I told them what I think, and therefore like, I can stop turning every single purchasing decision into a referendum on whether or not I'm a good person. Great. Elton, just, can I just follow up on that? Because we've just yep. had a um, question from Max Peters. He wants to know, how much do you think retailers influence consumers on changing their ways in regard to sustainability versus consumers asking you to change your ways as retailers? Who do you guys think is the influencer here? Do you want that, Eldon, or shall I? Oh, sorry, Eldon, <laughs> if you want to go ahead, then we'll come back to you, Eldon. Sure. <laughs> um, I think it goes both ways. Um, you know, like, let's take a really famous example, Nike. You know, there was these huge boycotts and an outcry in the 90s um, around ch uh, child labor and their supply chain. And since then, Nike has emerged as a leader in sustainability, and they've really put a lot of effort into ferreting out CSR issues, uh, uh, like social issues and labor issues in their supply chain. Why did they do that? Well, it wasn't be actually because they saw their profits go down during this period. It was because they were having a hard time hiring talent. Nobody wanted to work for the big evil, evil corporation anymore. So big enough outcries, um, and, you know, uh, companies are looking forward and saying, we don't want to take the risk of being discovered as being unethical and unsustainable by consumers. So there is that influence coming from consumers, but you have a million examples of very large retailers or brands who have very well-developed campaigns um, that are designed to get consumers to buy. And unfortunately, you would think that, okay, well, we'll just tell them to, you know, well, why are you guys so greedy? Like, don't be so greedy and it's going to be a problem. Well, uh, it even goes even further than that, more meta, where we're talking about how, you know, starts from startups to corporations, um, it is not profitable to tell your uh, consumers to buy less. Patagonia famously does that. We have no idea if that's a profitable move for them because they're a private company. It may or may not be, but um, it's, it's really hard to operate in this business climate um, unless you're privately owned and you are uh, and you sort of built it into you, the core identity of your brand that you'll take smaller profit more than in order to pursue these different things. Um, and so I would say there's a third option, which is consumers influence, brands influence, government influences. You can't forget about government. Government is a huge, huge deal and can level the playing field so that, you know, once uh, if these things are put into place, um, companies that are doing well will be able to soar instead of hand handicapping themselves with some of these more expensive or um, labor intensive uh, uh, initiatives that they're taking on. Great. Well, in a moment, I'll get Adam to jump in as well um, and give us probably his perspective actually on the role of legislation. But just before that, I want do, um, Lou to give us a quick update on what's happening at the DIF because uh, there's plenty more to come for you as well. There certainly is. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, live in the studio at 3 p.m., it's Collective Awareness with Doyne Farmer, who will be talking about complexity economics. And at the same time, 3 p.m. next Monday, tune in for Lewis Dartnells. He's written uh, the book called The Knowledge, and he's going to give us a short history of technology in which he'll ask, how would we cope if most of the world's population was wiped out? Sounds really good. How will we rebuild the best of what we've got? Find out from Lewis on Monday. And remember to join us with conversation on Twitter using hashtag diff. And if you think you're going to miss any sessions or you want to see some again, watch them again, or even us again, just go to catch up at thinkdiff.co. Great. Yes, and we're really enjoying the uh, comments and questions coming in at the moment. So please keep those flowing through. But I'll pick up again with you, Adam. So maybe you actually want to build on that idea of legislation or the role and also how you would see that, I guess, supporting your business. Yeah. Um I, I, I perhaps come from a, a different angle. Um, I, I personally think that businesses have a, a vital role in, in particularly marine plastic pollution, which is, which is my subject. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think governments are 
are, are, are very important. And when they make a move, it's, it's, it's very big and very impactful. But they're notoriously slow. Um, and, and I think there's, there's always a danger of, of, of waiting for government and, and just thinking, OK, the government will sort it. Um, I also think changing consumer uh, perception and, and, and attitudes and, and, um, and patterns is notoriously slow. So I actually think it, it's fundamental for businesses to influence both of those factors. Uh, businesses generally operate from quarter to quarter, so they, they can actually change very, very quickly, we, we, which we did. We, we eliminated, as you said earlier, 74% of our packaging um, plastic from our, from our packaging within a quarter. And, and that, that's a big change where there's will and there's will of the directors and there's will of, 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 of the business. And actually what that can do is, is that can influence consumers, which we we did, you know, as I said before, they didn't make that connection between the plastic in the hand and the plastic in the oceans until we did that. So suddenly we, we changed that and, and perhaps we're taking those consumers on a journey. Perhaps they're then asking that question of other businesses and, and how, they, how they work. And then once you prove that, that we can do that within a business model, and, and, and actually our model has been hugely popular, it's been hugely beneficial to a business, and it's actually saved us money. Um, once you prove that, then it actually proves to government that actually they, perhaps they should change legislation because it's, it does stack up. You know, often the, the barrier to, to change in legislation is, oh, the economy. And the economy come, often comes first before the environment, unfortunately. Um, but actually, if businesses start proving that actually it can work, then legislation is easier to change. So I, I personally think that businesses have a fundamental role in influencing change and they can change very, very quickly. Um, can I actually jump in? I think there's another question coming in from the audience that speaks really well to that and picks up on some of the economics as well. So we've got Harry saying, basically, let's face it, there's so much waste because it costs money to do anything about it. And why should they bother when they can just ask society to pay and that that's not going to change soon. But it sounds like you guys actually have managed to change it and make it beneficial economically for the business as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, a, a couple of points there. Um, yeah. uh, we, we, we took a lot of advice when, when, when we, we, we went through this activation and actually some of the advice was um, from leading professionals um, and I went against it. <laughs> um, it was a hard decision to make, but actually their, their advice was better manage plastic. Um, and actually I, I, I know that the most eco um, aware person from time to time is busy and they'll put stuff in the bin instead of recycling you know and mistakes happen so actually what I, what we wanted to do is we just wanted to take that responsibility out of the hands of, of, of the consumers so we literally just went okay um the, the least harmful, harmful packaging we possibly could go for with regards to marine plastic pollution on that subject so actually we we just said okay we're not going to lump it on the consumers we, yeah. we're, we're just going to present this message that actually okay, we understand your concerns about marine plastic pollution and actually here's packaging that actually means you don't have to do anything. It, it, worst case scenario is actually it escapes. It's not going to damage the environment. But we've made it that easy for you to just put it in the recycling. Yeah. So that was the first point and I've completely forgotten what the second point was. <laughs> um, can ask can, the question yes, again. Please, Maybe yeah, that it uh, <laughs> so it was talking about basically that there's so much waste because it costs uh, the business something to do uh, to yes. change it okay. um, and that's not going to change soon and you'd rather ask society to pay for it. Sure. Does that um, trigger a... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> costs. Okay, yeah. So it, it's it actually when, when we started our, our, our campaign, our, our activation around reducing plastic, um, the boxes that we actually went for were 110% more expensive over poly bags. If you lay that equation out in front of the finance directors or any business, mm. it, it's, a, it's a tough pill to swallow. Um, so actually we went back to the drawing board and actually we, and, 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 I, and, and I think this is a sticking point for most businesses is they just compare like for like, there we go, we can't do it. Um, but actually what we did is we went back to the drawing board and we looked at sustainability as a whole for, for across the whole of the business. And actually we agreed that when we find savings, first rule of sustainability reduce, inevitably that saves you money. The savings that we found, we reinvested into that more expensive box. Um, and actually, the financials for us and every business is different, but there's opportunities within every business. That first year, with, with 2.5 million packages that we sent, 110% more expensive, the net cost of that project was only £900, um, which is, 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 is tiny. Um, 
considering the, 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 the amount of goodwill from our customers and, and the positive PR we had around Huge it, you spend, you, you spend 900 pounds on that alone. Yeah. Um, and actually in the, in the second phase, it's actually going to save us money um, because we looked at the, the a, a holistic approach to that. So I, I think that the financials do stack up for us. I know every business is different, but hopefully they can take away that model and, and actually apply it. Um, it it's just having that will to actually change it. And in any other department of a business, you overcome things. You know, the, the IT department, if it's 110% more expensive, but we really need it, let's figure out how we do it. Businesses are very good at, at finding a way. They, they don't just give up. And it's bizarre that we have that attitude towards sustainability. Um, quite often, oh no, it's too expensive. But actually, we need to apply that business attributes that we have in every other department to sustainability to overcome those, those challenges. Great, thanks. So yeah, you obviously have a very clear perspective and thought through how you want your system uh, and your company to look and mm -hmm. have envisioned that. And this is where I, I'll bring Alden back in. So also, I guess, getting your perspective, I know you're in the textiles space and have, have definitely written around um, uh, the fashion in your conscious consumerism blog. So how would you uh, take that idea of trying to think about what the system looks like and what needs to change to the textile system? What should the textile system look like uh, if we wanted to sort of, I guess, apply the same thinking lens that Adam's taken in his business? Well, the first thing to know before I answer this question is that the fashion industry is incredibly complex. You take all of the complexities that come with the food system and then you layer 10 more of our steps and locations along the way on top of that. So, so if you compare cotton to asparagus, it's as if the asparagus was going to go to four different more countries before it arrives to your plate. So it's incredibly complex. That's both a weakness and a, um, and a strength of addressing fashion's waste problem because fashion... Um, right now, fashion is sort of one of the last industries to sort of co to come to the table in terms of sustainability. And as of right now, as of this moment, there is no way for a fashion, a mass market fashion company. I'm not even talking just fast fashion. I'm talking any brands that you could find in in multiple cities. There's there's not really a way to to manufacture something in a mass market way that it can be recycled or composted um, at the end of its life because of a variety of factors. Um, however, there is technology that's being researched and funded by large fashion corporations to try to figure out the answer to this question. So for example, um, you know, again, I'd love to see, everyone wants to see circularity in the fashion industry. Um, but some of the challenges are, uh, for example, when you mix polyester with cotton, completely unrecyclable, right? Just goes to the waste bin. Um, and so what people are trying to do now is to um, design things cradle to cradle so that um, on the front end, it's manufactured in a way that's um, sustainable and ethical. Um, it's available. It's either available for use for a long time or it doesn't matter if you only wear it 10 times because you can um, throw it in the compost bin when you're done, just like you would a banana peel, right? You eat the banana, you throw the banana peel in the compost bin and a circle of life continues. So um, there are technologies around um, making leather out of mushrooms, um, making fabric out of mushrooms. Um, there is um, technology being researched uh, to dye natural fabrics um, in a way that's non-toxic so that um, those toxins don't go into the soil if you were to com compost your, um, your cotton t-shirt. You can't really compost a cotton t-shirt right now because it, it's, it has all this stuff in it that's like really bad for the environment. Um, and so you're thinking about all these, different, all these different ways you can make it circular or when it comes to polyester, um, creating a polyester recycling process um, that can easily and cheaply break down the polyester and make it into new polyester. Um, and Alden. then finally, um, 
uh, thinking about how you can easily label things so that mm -hmm. instead of a person, like if you're, if you donate things right now, there are human hands that are having to hold up a shirt and make a split second decision about what pile it goes in. And so there's no way to really do that efficiently, especially when you're talking about materials. Um, so there is technology around um, being able to scan the cotton on a shirt and it'll tell you this is, um, you know, 98% cotton and 2% spandex, and then you can put it in the right place. And so those are some really exciting things. And the reason why the complexity of the fashion supply chain, like I said, you know, that's a weakness, but it's also a strength because in fashion, because fashion touches every one of the issues that we're struggling with as a society right now in terms of agriculture, shipping, uh, labor, um, toxicity, um, you know, electricity generation, like all these different things. Once we figure out the answer to all these questions, we're going to, that's going to have knock on ripple effects across all these different other industries in terms of waste. So it's actually a really exciting time to be looking at fashion and how we can make it circular or address the waste issues because um, it's new, it's exciting, a lot of things are happening, and it's a really powerful industry to, to get into in terms, of, in terms of these issues and solutions. Th thank you. Um, we, I can't believe we are nearly out of time. Could I just ask both of you one final question? What one thing gives you both hope that these waste problems could eventually be eliminated? Um, shall I go first, Alden? Would you like me to get? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess just being here, like now, talking about this, yeah. the, the, this, these kind of subjects really wouldn't get airtime, particularly marine plastic pollution. Maybe two or five years ago. Yeah. Um, so actually, the, the amount of conferences, the amount that the people are engaging with this, from 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 the wider audience to to, to industry, um, to the fact that there is an Ellen MacArthur Foundation. You know, so I I think. It, we're at a, a pivotal point, which is exciting, um, and I think we're on a journey that, that's that's very positive. So that's what gives me hope. Thank you, Eldon. Um, so I actually, the thing that makes me most excited is the fact that I've had the honour to be invited to be in the room with um, a lot of executives from very very large fashion companies who are hashing out these issues. And what that shows me is that companies that, that you would never expect to care deeply about this. I mean, on the outside, they're monolith. They don't seem to care. They're not really doing that much. On the inside, they're saying, all right, how are we going to fix this? They're talking to their competitors and saying, how can we fix this together? And so it gets me really excited because um, there are people and they're listening and they're you know, they're trying to figure out a way forward and they're cooperating with each other. It's called pre-competitive um, pre -competitive innovation to figure out these problems. So um, that gets me really excited because I feel like in the next 10 years, um, the money's being put there, the research is being put there, the manpower is being put there. I think we're going to figure out the answer to some of these problems, but it's going to be a hard slog, it's going to be messy, but I think we're going to get there. Great. Well, thanks, Adam and Alden. We've really enjoyed this conversation and we do need to leave it there for today. But of course, this doesn't mean the conversation has to end. We're just hearing about the power of sharing the message. And the whole idea of this is that you discuss it at home and discuss it in your workplaces. And it's about trying to find those people, the Adams, the people that Alden are talking about working in the textiles industry that are in the positions to have that catalytic change at the systems level. So I've really enjoyed hearing from Adam about how you're doing that in your business. I also really enjoyed yeah. hearing from Alden around how you don't have to lose all hope as a consumer that you can do anything. Um, it's still really important to actually find the places that you can make that change. I liked the idea of supporting research that then actually feeds into the system level thinking about what and where needs to change. Um, so if you want to learn any more about today's guests, definitely uh, check out their biographies on the session, session page. And I think you can also find uh, Alden's um, website, obviously, and Adam's website for Surfdome. Um, apart from that, thank you for joining us and for all the questions as well that really made for an interactive and much more exciting discussion for us.
Remember, the DIF is an online festival that gives a platform to hundreds of brilliant ideas. You, will, you are bound to find something you love at thinkdiff.co. And converse with us. Tell us what you think at hashtag thinkdiff. Lovely to see you. Back, come back soon. Bye.